these little kids would look at me and eventually they would give me the self-worth that I didn't give myself. And that changed my life forever. Welcome. You're listening to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 576. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Sensei Greg Williams. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here from Martial Arts Radio. I'm the founder of Whistlekick. I'm a passionate traditional martial artist, and that's why everything that we're doing at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional arts. If you want to see all the stuff that we've got going on, go to whistlekick.com. We are constantly updating and improving that site, adding all the things that we have happening. If it's been a while, make sure you check it out. And if you want to check out stuff for this show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we're going to put all the episodes, all the transcripts, all the photos, links, videos, all the other stuff that's going to help you get the most out of each and every episode we've ever done. They are all available for you for free on that website. If you want to support our work here at Whistlekick, you can buy something at whistlekick.com using the code podcast15. You could also support our Patreon, buy a book, leave a review. There's a lot of different ways that you can help us out. And to those of you who do so, Thank you. We really do appreciate you. To those of you who have not yet, doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be financial. Just know that when you help us out, it helps spread our message. It helps spread the work that we are doing and it's important. So please consider doing so if you have not already. Our goal at Whistlekick, of course, with this show is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. And that's probably why you listen. Today's guest comes in as a referral, and we had a wonderful conversation. We had some great chats before and after the show, stuff that unfortunately you're not going to get to hear, but I can tell you that what happened in the middle was nothing short of wonderful. When I get the opportunity to find some common ground with a guest, be that training or people or geographic area, and in this case, we've got all three. I get to have a really interesting and sometimes powerful conversation. That's what happened today. So here's my conversation with Sensei Greg. Hey, Sensei Greg, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy, how you doing? Great to meet you virtually. Yeah, yeah, great to meet you as well. Thanks for doing this. No problem. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure. I like listening to the show. Well, thank you. uh, Andrew Adams uh, turned me on to it. I've listened to a number of episodes and definitely enjoy it. Thanks. Well, th- well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, Andrew's been a, a tremendous asset to the show. If I had known how much more fun I would have doing Thursday episodes with him, I would have started doing them with him years ago. Yeah, don't let don't let him hear that too much. Though. I don't want to get his head. Oh, it might be too late. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy. He is. He's a good guy Very and a good, good friend. I, really, I appreciate him. How do you know Andrew? I know Andrew through, um, well, when I started in... I started in martial arts in 1988, but um, in about 2006, I started teaching MMA as a way to connect mm. people up here. And one of the that's th- early. What's that? That's early for MMA. Yeah, yeah. 96. Well, I actually, I mean, we'll, we'll get into probably the, the history of sure how I got there, but um, yeah, I started teaching an MMA student who had um, it was part of Andrew's dojo, I believe. Okay. So, um, you know, they were connected and eventually I got to know those group of people and Andrew was one of them and we just clicked and became good friends. Yeah. He's a good guy. We, we, we were chatting you and I just before the show. And I, I mentioned an instructor of mine, you, you, you mentioned a style. I mentioned a person I trained with and you know, that name. And that's one of the interesting things to me about martial arts, especially in Northern New England that you know there are only so many of us yeah and when you talk about something that just inherently requires other people you know here here we are 2021 early 2021 pandemic still going i think we we all see how challenging doing martial arts in, in kind of a bubble can be you know we need those that engagement with other people and you know that leads to knowing a lot of people which is fun yeah yeah, I, I think uh, for me, a large part of martial arts is community. And um, the community aspect of it is really something that I cherish more than most parts of the martial arts. You know, the brotherhood, the community, building communities, 
is probably my one of my greatest assets and probably one of my my best gifts mm. is to bring people into a community of a loving environment and community of martial arts. That's not something that I think everyone at least consciously values. Is it something that you've always recognized as being important? Well, I think I got to go back to uh, to the beginning. Of go back. Yeah, I started. Yeah. Because... Here we go. The first time I ever don't ask that question right off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we have <laughs> see for any listeners who are like, why does Jeremy always ask that question? See, we have to go there. Even if I try not to, we're going to end up there. So go ahead. I, yeah. And I figured we'd get there, but I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know I'd be the one initiating it, but whatever. <laughs> here we go. It's, uh, your, it's your episode. It's... <laughs> right on, man. So um, I'll tell you really like right now, my work, in the community is I do prevention work and that's um, Northern Grafton in Coas County. I work for a, an organization that's the public health network and it's, uh, I do the um, drug prevention for the, for the Northern third of the state. So um, if you go back to my roots, when I started martial arts, I was, I was not very young. I was 26 when I started. And to be honest, I was struggling with uh, drugs and alcohol a little bit before before starting martial arts, I always wanted to do it. My brother, my brother did it. My, by the time he did it and quit, then um, my parents didn't want to pay for it. So I really, being a middle child, I didn't really. They didn't take me to martial arts class, but I always loved it. I always loved fighting. I always loved martial arts. I wasn't a big fighter as a kid, but I did. I, the, the only time I ever fought, I was either standing up against bullies or standing up for myself. So. You know, I did have a couple of scraps growing up on Long Island when I was a young young kid. But uh, I went to college, and by the time I got out of college, I was um, I was drifting around a little bit. It really didn't have any purpose. I graduated with a degree in art, and it was no real clear pathway for me to you know start building large scale metal sculptures with no money and you know no no pathway to go there. So I kind of floated around a little. I I did odd jobs and. Uh, I struggled with drugs and alcohol a little bit. And finally, yeah, I took a trip after graduating. I went to New Zealand and I went with virtually no money in my pocket. I, I think I landed in New Zealand with 50 bucks in my pocket and I uh, traveled around and wound up getting a job and, uh, you know, picking apples on an apple orchard and living really, really good time. I mean, I lived in the apple orchard and, they take me into town. I'd load up fruits and vegetables from Auckland, go to Auckland, drive an hour up north, and then uh, they'd sell the fruits and vegetables at a vegetable stand. So I was there for about a month or so, and I traveled around. Made, I made a little bit of money so I could travel around and go to Australia. And I put myself in some pretty, pretty interesting situations where, you know, I've always been a big guy. I've always been athletic, and people don't normally pick on me, but I was in situations where you know, there were gangs, there were groups of people. And I was on the street just kind of bumming around. And I really decided, I said, when I get back to New York, when I get back to Long Island, I'm going to start studying jujitsu. And uh, one of my um, friends had been bugging me to go to this class with Sensei Tom Renner, my first sensei, uh, still my sensei right now. Uh, so came back to New York, I started studying, training, I fell in love with jujitsu. This is 1988. And um, I was still, I was still partying. I was still going out drinking, and you know, still living a single life and enjoying myself. And what happened? I was, I was getting good. My teacher used to put me in front of the kids and have me teach the kids class. I would have me teach the kids class. So, kids class was typically on Saturday morning, and. I would show up a little bit hungover, <laughs> but these kids would look at me as somebody really, really special. So, you know, they would, they would kind of adore me, if you will. They would look at me as like, Oh, sensei Greg's teaching. That's great. You know, these little kids would look at me and eventually they would give me the self-worth that I didn't give myself. And that changed my life forever. I, cleaned up from drugs and alcohol. I, and when I say drugs, I mean, I was probably smoking a little bit of weed and drinking and partying too much. But 
I decided at that point to stop and not to be a hypocrite because these kids looked at me like I was special. And I, I realized, you know, I had something to give. So they changed my life. And from that point on, I've always taught kids and I will always teach kids and try to bring them into a community that helps them see the value in themselves. So that's where I get a sense of community from. Well, that's the work I do now, too. I I do. uh, Yeah. You know, I always look I always believe in youth and always will uh, that they are obviously they're our future. But. I believe we ha- we have an obligation, even as martial artists, to um, to build them up as best we can. Now, I have, I have a theory, and this theory is played out. Uh, I don't think it's a hundred percent of the time. I think we've had I've, I've had a couple strikes as I've swung with this question, but I'm going to ask it again here. You know, when when you talk about your upbringing, you're talking about you know, going to New Zealand with fifty bucks in your pocket. You know, that tells me you were you were avoiding something, leaving something. Yeah. And drugs and alcohol partying, I, th- I think most of us would agree there's some kind of coping mechanism for most people when they're indulging in those things. And the way you described it, these children now validating your self-worth and that being enough that you could set these other things down. So the question for me, me then is, what, what was missing that you were trying to plug those holes with these other things? That's a good question. That's a, that's a good question. That's a great question. I don't know. Um, I came from a, re- I come from a really good family. My brothers and sisters are, I was, you know, I was never a bad person, but they never struggled with things that I did. So, you, you know, it wasn't like we grew up in, um, you know, in poverty. My next door neighbor was a professional baseball player and a legend in New York. Uh, we lived in a great neighborhood. We had every, everything we needed, but I don't know. That's a, it's a good question. I don't know what was missing. I know that when I went to New Zealand, um, I was, I think I was searching for myself. I would think I was searching within to, you know, to find my purpose. I, I didn't have any purpose in the world. And I think that's, that's really the truth is, um, you know, maybe I was awake enough to know, that life has some kind of purpose. It's getting a little philosophical. So <laughs> excuse me if I go run with oh, it. No, oh, no, Lord. but totally good. You know, as a 20, uh, well, think of, think of today, even, you know, why are we on the planet at 20, at 20 something years old? I felt the need to go to New Zealand. When I landed in New Zealand, I, I felt more at home than I did in, on Long Island, New York. I don't know why that was, but I just, I felt it. So I, I had, I was kind of, um, in tune with things, but I didn't have any purpose. I mean, what was I going to do? I had opportunities. Uh, I, I, I think I was, um, I think I'm a fairly intelligent person. I had opportunities to make a lot of money, but that didn't interest me. And a lot of my friends were, you know, going to brokerage firms and, and starting careers and doing that. And I just, I didn't see the purpose in just trying to earn money for the sake of earning money and have a life. I, I needed more purpose. I really needed purpose. And what those kids showed me, not only self-worth, but they validated me as a teacher. And I cherish that, that role. And I, I've always seen that as my purpose now to be a teacher. So that was, I found, I found my purpose in life and that was teaching. Yeah. So you started working with those kids changed your life i mean i i I don't think there's a a better phrase you know as cliche as it is those children changed your life yeah so what what did the next few you know steps down the path look like for you um well the next path i i I was i was at dead-end jobs right there so this is 1988 um i needed to move into so I needed to move into a better situation, kind of better uh, living situation. So my brother was out in California. And now we're talking 88, probably 90. A couple of years go by, I'm a brown belt. Um, My brother's living, I'm I'm getting ready to test my black belt. My brother's living in California in in, uh, in Palmdale. And he's working down in the valley. And he says, um, you should come out here. I'm training at 
uh, Benny the Jets, Jet, the Jet Center, the world famous Jet Center. And I had two jobs, but they were both like dead end jobs. They were just, I was working in a bar as a bouncer and a bartender, and I was working at a sandwich shop. So they weren't like, uh, they weren't, nobody was really going to miss me if I left. <laughs> I didn't really have much. So I said, yeah, I'll go out to California. I, I would love to go train at the, you know, when am I going to get this opportunity again? You know? So go out to the, so I, I decided to move to California and live with my brother. And he was generous enough to, you know, just come live with me. He was single. So we were hanging out. Um, I'll never forget. I started going down to the jet center and, uh, you know, it was down there in Van Nuys and I I'd go down there and I'd pick up a donut and a coffee on the way down. Or my brother worked at uh, MetLife right across the street from this donut shop, yum, yum donuts. And I'm in there one day. It's just me and the guy behind the counter and in walks Bill Wallace, super fun. And I'm like, Bill Wallace? He's like, yeah, how you doing? I go, I'm, I'm great. How are you? He goes, yeah, I'm doing great. What are you doing? He said, I'm heading down to the Jet Center. I said, me too. I'll see you down there. So I got to know Bill Wallace, who I looked at, you know, I've, I've only seen him in magazines and movies, you know, like the Octagon, stuff like that. And um, that was pretty typical of what was to, to follow. I mean, I went down, trained at the Jet Center, and I met so many incredible incredible people, martial artists, actors. It was, it was, you know, I was in California. I was in the Mecca. So that was my next step to go there. Was there, and this is, this is coming from someone who has also had the chance to, to meet and hang out with Bill Wallace a bit. There's a surreal element, you know, when you see someone who is doing a thing that you're doing, but they're doing it at such a high level. Oh my God. You know, this, this, and, and it could be, you know, the same thing being, you know, someone who picks at a guitar and you you bump into, you know, a, a Eric Clapton. Yeah. You know, you're like, whoa, you know, that guy knows what he's doing with this thing way better than I do. You know, what what was it like being around those people and and having that? I don't know that I want to use the term role model, but a, a examples of what hard work could yield yeah um again you, i gotta go back because you, you touched on something the example of what hard work yields that's a great way to describe the grind and i've been fortunate when i was a yellow belt before i even left for california to meet wally J. and um you know he I'm in a video with him in 1988, I think, where he's kind of uh, using me as an UK. And you talk about a guy who has put the time. I mean, this I met Wally J when he was 75 years old. He'd been doing martial arts probably since 1920, in the 20s. I think he was born in uh, 1914 and, you know, passed away when he was 94, 95, I think. And, uh, did martial arts his whole life and to be in the presence of somebody who is, has that much commitment that had a really profound effect on me as well. I mean, when I saw what, how, not only how he moved, but again, communities, when I saw how, how he accepted people and treated me a yellow belt, like I was a 10th degree black belt that stuck with me forever too. He treated me like I was an equal and I was in awe, but you know, that stuck with me. And that, and that, that point, I, I almost, uh, something registered me and I said, I want to do, I, I don't want to just do this for a few years. I want to do this for a lifetime because I want to be that type of a person who can affect people the way he affected me. And uh, Bill Wallace, Benny Urquidez, um, so many people that I've met there, uh, Higa Machado, um, Bridget Riley, uh, Danny Lopez, these, these people, and my teacher, Tom Renner, has been doing it. I've been, I, I feel like a, an old man doing it for 30 years. These guys have been doing it for 40, 50 years or more. So it's, it's incredible to be around that. And it's inspiring. And it shows you, 
the opportunities that you have and shows you what, what the grind can do. And I got to say, Jeremy, I don't know how many episodes you've recorded, but you're one of my heroes too, because you've, uh, <laughs> you've grinded out so many episodes, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds, almost Thank thousands you. of episodes. So I have tremendous respect for people that embrace the grind. So I hope that answers the question. It does. It does. And it feels appropriate because I, I, I made the musical reference and I, I can't help but bring this quote up. Not that I ever get it exactly right, but there, there's a quote from Dave Grohl, formerly of Nirvana yeah. now. Foo Fighters. You know, Foo Fighters. And yeah. Dave Grohl, I mean, he stands on his own at the same time talking about how do you become a famous musician? You get some friends and you go in the garage and you're terrible for years. Yeah. And then 20 years later, after being terrible, you just kind of wake up one day and you're like, wow, hey, I don't suck. Now we're pretty good. I don't suck so much. Exactly. Exactly. And and that's and it's something that I think is I think that that quote resonates for me and for a lot of martial artists because we see it very clearly in hindsight because there's so many different little bits that go into being a martial artist. And, you know, you could. Even even within a single style, forget that there's different things you can learn from different people, but from the same instructor, you can dig into stances and and punches and kicks and blocks and forms and, 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 and all these different things. And you're never going to be constantly progressing at all of them because there's too much. Right. And so that that iterative process of getting better at not just martial arts, but anything, you know, I, I think that's why we've been able to do this show for years and, and achieve what we have because I brought a martial arts mindset to it. When I talk, you know, in my, my day-to-day life, you know, sometimes I'm talking about work that's not martial arts related to non-martial artists, which I know that's weird. And, and I don't really, I don't always love it. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about martial arts, but I can still bring in that, that iterative test, repeat, improve 1% better, whatever you want to call it philosophy that's so inherent to martial arts and, and thus to us as martial artists without a doubt without a doubt i think um you know i have tremendous respect for um somebody i i call a friend i don't know if he considers me a friend but um i've known him for quite a while and he just fought this past weekend calvin calvin cater i don't know if you it's mma i know the name well he owns the, the combat zone an organization that we fight for he had an mma fight where he got battered and beaten for five rounds. Uh, mm. It was it was kind of ugly, but you know he said something. You can't stop a guy who won't quit. You know he'll be back. He'll he'll keep going. So you know if you've got quit, even one of my acting friends, um, Thomas Ryan, says uh, one of his favorite quotes is, you know, what do you tell to a beginning a beginning actor? If there's something that's going to derail you, then quit right now, because if you're going to let something defeat you, then let it happen right now and stop. Don't waste your time. But if you put it in your head that you're just going to succeed, you, you just don't stop, you know, and it can be, uh, it can be difficult at times, but you know, that's what, that's what the common denominator, I think between so many great people, mm. you don't let anything stop them. There's plenty of times I'm sure you would rather be doing something than the podcast or things come up and you're like, no, well, I'm, you're committed. And I always, uh, it, it, yes, I always say I'm committed, and sometimes I think I should be committed. <laughs> it's a fine line between the two, <laughs> right? And I think that that's an important line. I think it's an important distinction because if if what you were doing in anything makes sense to everyone, then you're probably not pushing the envelope. Yeah. Well, and I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and and twisted that a little bit to say if everybody's happy with what you're doing you're not creating any change right i totally agree totally agree and i'm i mean you know you know my area because we're not we're not that far apart and i've owned a successful martial arts school up here for 20 years imagine the uh perseverance that would take (laughs) it's not easy it's in rural it's a rural area and there's just not a lot of people but i've had i've been very very fortunate i've had great students and great support from not only um my student base but my my community has really supported this because they see they see the benefit of it right 
And that's one of the things that I think is really interesting about martial arts in New England. And, you know, listeners know I'm going to speak to New England because it's where I, I've grown up. I've, I've certainly traveled, but I don't know other areas the way I know New England. When we look at New England, we see some small schools that are very occasional, part-time. They've got, you know, a couple dozen students. And that's great. And they love that. The students are happy. Instructors happy. They've got another job. Works great. But then you've also got schools that are full-time schools with multiple employees in towns of 1,500, 2,000 people. Yeah. We've had them on the show. People who have invested in their community for literally decades, and the community has responded. There's that word that you brought up at the top of the episode, community. And it is a gateway to so many things. It, it is. It is. You know, when I started here, um, started in the town of Whitefield, population, I think 800. I mean, I'm sorry, not 800, um, 1,500. And I had 80 80 or 90 students. And all I could think of was, God, if I was in Manhattan and I had that ratio. <laughs> I have you, you would, students. You'd need a multi-story, you need a skyscraper. I know, I know. Um, Class is starting every five minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was the only teacher, you know. <laughs> so, I have to teach, I mean, think about that. Like how many... Um, the ratio up here and that was of course is not a lot to do so when you open something up people check it out and um you know i've been really i've been really fortunate and um you know another one of the other things i do is i try i, I try to give students what they need you know i think that's part of part of the success that i've had up here is uh, giving students what they need not not what i've learned and then not just what i want to give them but in a way, um, really getting adept at listening to them, connecting with them in a way that I can sense what they what they want to get out of martial arts. You know, how do you do that? Talk, talk about that. I've got I've got my suspicions, but this yeah. sounds like something we should unpack. Well, I mean, obviously, I don't know if you can tell by this podcast, but I'm a talker. So I love talking to people. <laughs> I, I can, love people. I, tell, yeah. I, I love it. I love talk. I love talking to you. It's just like, it's a highlight of my day. So um, by talking, number one, but also by, I, I guess I've developed a series of, you know, my system is kind of well-rounded, very well-rounded, I think. So I'm able to um, find what any student does well. Right. So if the kid's really good at kicking, but he can't roll, do a forward roll, I build them up on the kicking and I learn how to kind of highlight and promote and like get them feeling so good about that. There's a little bit of the rolling and teaching that doesn't isn't so painful. So I really do try uh, positive reinforcement is tremendous. And I, I've, I've learned over the years that, um, you know, there's this system in schools where it's positive youth development or positive reinforcement is like this scientific formula for uh, praising somebody like 78% of the time. And when you criticize them in a way, you don't really criticize you. You just correct in a way that's non, non, uh, not hurtful. You know what I'm saying? So constructive criticism. Constructive, is that yes. Kind of constructive thing? criticism yeah. and, and like overload on the praise and, I have somebody explained this to me and I said, well, that's what I, that's what I figured out years ago. That's how I, that's how I teach, you know, and I think a lot of martial arts teachers figure that out early. You know, you, how do you get the most out of your students? And it's not even about retention. I mean, it is, and it isn't because we want to retain students. So we want to give them, you know, what they're looking for. So we want to praise them and make them believe that they're doing well. We want to build them up. We don't want to tear them down. So, um, the positive reinforcement and kind of um, navigating through that, recognizing that and adjusting to it is really, um, I, I think it's an art form and it takes experience. It takes time because you get all types of, you get all types of individuals. So you have, you know, when we run through my system, uh, run through the class, I'm sure it's, we're never, we're never doing one thing over and over again. I keep, I like to bounce around. I like to, you know, that, that will help each student find something they can click onto, hopefully. And then recognizing that and building them up and, you know, going forward from there. I think that's how, that's how I've had a lot of success. 
I, I think there is something valuable inherently in the variety that martial arts brings. If we think about the way traditional martial arts is is usually put forward, you know, we've got forms, we've got sparring, we've got yep. self defense, we've got basics, and different personality types are going to gravitate towards different aspects. And maybe you don't like everything. When I was a kid, I didn't like sparring. It scared me. I wasn't good at it. I was small, but I really found a lot of passion in doing forms. Right. And had it not been for forms, I don't know that I would have stuck around. Right. Because that was the thing. That was a thing I could figuratively hang my hat on and say, ah, I, I'm seeing my development here. I enjoy this. And the rest of it is my admittance fee to doing this. Right. Right. And I, yeah. I think that's a good way to, uh, that's what I see a lot. I always gravitated towards throwing, like the judo arts and judo throwing arts and also um, ground ground fighting, grappling mm -hmm. and boxing, Western boxing, the striking. So, you know, that, that made me a natural fit for, for MMA because I studied all of those kind of in depth. So many different ranges. Yeah. yeah. We, we talked about jujitsu and, and, but was judo in there too? Did, yeah. did I, did I, did you say it and I missed it? Or yeah, did you just I, sneak it in there just now? No, I studied judo for sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. I competed in judo. I competed in, um, and um, I didn't want to, I really didn't want to come. I see, I never really was into competition in California. Uh, but my teacher was really, really, I studied at Antelope, um, Antelope Valley Jiu Judo Club. So it was this English guy, Steve Bell, and um, we didn't really get along too good. But there was, there was, the, only, <laughs> it was the only judo club in town. I love judo, so I went there. And, uh, you know, he, he, he wanted me to compete because I was proficient. And um, I used to... Yeah, I don't know if you know, but judo is really, it's a throwing art, but it's half on the ground as well, right? So, yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, do, are you familiar? Do you like judo? Do you, are you familiar with it? I, I, did a, I did a little bit of judo. I, did? I was lucky. Uh, the, the class was poorly attended. I had a, a, had a summer long, uh, once a week, ended up being one-on-one. -on -one uh, so, you know, that there, there's, uh, there's uh, throwing nage and there's niwaza, the ground techniques. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had a... Um, my jujitsu that I learned, even from Wally J. Well, Wally J was a very uh, highly decorated judo player, and he introduced me a uh, judo coach also, and um, he introduced me to Willie Cahill through some. Uh, and I actually used to go up and train with Willie Cahill, and uh, he was an Olympic judo coach, and he was up in San Bruno, near San Francisco. So mm -hmm. I had some I had some experience and. My judo coach in, in the Antelope Valley in Palmdale, he didn't, we didn't get along too good. Um, I think I used to use different types of techniques that he, he didn't really like. He was, but he was kind of a, he was kind of a uh, opinionated guy. I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. And he made me compete in order to go up in rank. So I did compete and I, I did fairly well competing. Yeah. I love judo. I love it. I, unfortunately, um, my back doesn't love judo the way I love judo. <laughs> yeah. All right. Learned a lot from Wally J. Learned a lot about uh, judo from Wally J. And that's something that I, th I think people forget is that, you know, back in the, my understanding of it, you know, this is certainly not experiential, but my understanding of grappling arts in the 60s, 70s, 80s is that, the lines were really blurry. There was a lot more cross training in those disciplines back then than there were in striking discipline. Yeah, I believe so. You talk what what do you what era are you talking about? Seventies, eighties? Yeah, yeah. It's anytime I hear about somebody who, who practiced or played judo back then, it seems like they they were doing some jujitsu as well, and vice versa. Yeah, and then quite often, the, you know, I'll, I'll find out about aikido and hapkido in that mix too. You know, it seemed like people who were grappling were like, I, I, give me everything that's grappling. Whereas strikers were in that same area era were far less prone to say, oh, well, you know, I'm doing this flavor of karate. I'm also going to go do 
that karate and taekwondo and this and that. Yeah, and yeah. That. Or even like Muay Thai as opposed to American kickboxing. You know, you're either sure. one or the other. Yeah. Sure. I, I think on the West Coast, I mean, they really blew it up, um, blending um, the ground fighting into a lot of systems, obviously, with the, uh, the Gracies and the emergence of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu back then. But I never really, um, I don't know, there was an attitude that came along with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu back in the day that I loved the techniques, but, you know, I didn't really necessarily, it wasn't a very welcoming atmosphere until you broke in. Mm. Uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I, I think I know what you mean. Well, I've been into a couple of, you know, the exception would be, I think, the Machado, Higa Machado, um, so I met Higa Machado in, a, in an acting class um, where I was in what, what they called was the toughest acting class in L.A. Because there was guys like, I don't know if you know who Roger Yuan is. Roger's a, um, he's a stuntman, but a great martial artist and uh, met him at the Jet Center. I, I made the, uh, I was on Benny's stunt team and did a few movies with um with the stunt team, Benny Urquidez has had a team that he would, uh, chore he choreographed a bunch of movies and he had a team and it was like Roger Yuan, Bridget Riley, the boxer, Higa Machado came in, Damun Chan, Danny Lopez, the boxer. And, um, yeah, when I met Higa Machado, I just thought he was like a really nice guy. And I know his, uh, I knew his credentials. So I went and trained with him and it was a really, it was a really accepting environment. But when I went to other, some other, Brazilian jiu-jitsu clubs, it always seemed like um, there was a chip on sh the shoulder. And this is back in the day, you know, this is back in, um, you know, the early 90s. Even um, even in my judo club, there was a guy who, I don't know, he's kind of a charlatan. I'm not going to mention his name, but he, he passed himself off as Brazilian. I don't even think he was. And um, he would act all, he would act macho and, you know, he always had this really bad attitude and he was just, he was not a good person. And, um, I remember, you know, he, he did some, he, he was just dirty, just dirty, nasty. And, uh, you know, I remember one time he put me in a, he went to put me in an armbar and he just kicked me in the nose just to get my head out of the way. But, you know, it was like, okay, you know, I see we're playing prison rules. Okay. You know, the attitude was just there, you know, like guys, would, I had a guy come into my gym, when I owned a dojo in California, one of my own teammates, he was studying on the side. He came into my gym one day and he says, um, well, you want to roll? I go, yeah, let's roll. So, you know, we're doing a light roll. And all of a sudden he gets my arm and he pops it. He pops my arm. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I, I never, I, I didn't forget it. He came back again. And okay, this time, guess what happened? I, put him in an arm bar. He didn't want to tap right away. I popped his arm. You know, I, I wouldn't do it back to him if he didn't do it to me. It was just like, I think guys got a kick out of going into other dojos. You, you know, I owned a jujitsu studio in uh, 1996 in Southern California. So, you know, BJJ was coming up and they would, guys would come into my gym just to, um, you know, to try and hurt me. And this guy tried to hurt me. So he, he popped my arm and I, you know, I, he was going harder than I thought we should have been, you know, we rolling and all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting ready to tap and he goes quick and he pops my arm. Okay, great. He came back. To, and like I said, he came back the next time when I did it to him, he didn't really like it that much. So I remember rolling. Somehow running, they never do. Yeah, they never do. So I, I remember running into him. I saw him at his work or something. I go, Hey, how you doing? You know, with kind of a sly grin. I was like, hey, how you doing? He goes, ah, my arm still hurts. I go, yeah, mine too. So what else is up? You know, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you're going to complain to me about your arm hurting after what you tried? You know, I mean, we get over it. I think um, he might have held a grudge because we were rolling one day in, in judo. We were doing judo and we were rolling and he didn't get his fingers out and I rolled him over. I think I broke four of his fingers, but that was an accident. That wasn't on purpose, you know. Your fingers get caught on the mat and stuff happens. It happens. It happens. Yeah. What what we do, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'm surprised more of us don't get hurt more often. Yeah. Yeah, true. True. There's a there's a presence of mind that comes from training 
Uh, you, you've got to be there. You've got to be in the moment. And, and even when you are, things are going to go wrong. Yeah. And you also know, I mean, if you've been doing it a little while, you know when somebody's trying to hurt you and when somebody does it by accident. Yeah. You can really oh, feel you, you can fear feel it when you connect with people, uh, even when you're fighting. That's a great thing about about martial arts. You know, that community gets built around trust that they won't hurt you. You know, like with small circle jujitsu and joint locks, you know, you're putting your wrist and your livelihood in somebody's hands and then they're going to put it back in your hands. So you build that. You, that's a great trust that builds there. But you know when somebody's trying to hurt you. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, how did you get back over here? I mean, we, we've we've talked about you being out on the West Coast, but yeah. you're in New Hampshire now. How how did that transpire? Well, I met I met my wife um, when I was teaching out there. Uh, I was working, I was working and teaching, and my wife. We got together. Um, she had a three year old three year old daughter at the time, and um, two thousand. We, let's see, about 2000, yeah, my wife got pregnant with my youngest daughter. 9-11 had just happened. And I was living in a really, really nice place in um, this place called Stevenson Ranch, California. And uh, it was really nice. It was beautiful. Uh, it was a quintessential um, utopia, suburban utopia. But to be honest, I didn't feel comfortable living there. Um, my wife and I both, we felt out of place. So we came to visit her mother who lives in Littleton, still does. And we looked at, just kind of jokingly looked at some property. And for the same price that I had out there, uh, for the same price I was paying for 10 feet on each side and 25 feet in the backyard, I came out here and pretty much uh, place looked like a golf course. I have 75 acres, a view of Mount Washington. The view is incredible, um, a nice big home. And it was the same exact price. So we decided to just make the move, just do it. And yeah, we decided to just uh, leave our life there and come out and start our life here because uh, my daughters at the time were one and five. So, um, you know, figured she'd be starting school. And uh, to be honest, I haven't regretted one day of moving out here. It's a total culture shock. Uh, everybody asks, what, what, why'd you move out here? And my standard answer is uh, witness protection program, because who would come looking for you in Dalton, New Hampshire? Right. They would give right. up. <laughs> they, they wouldn't even do it. Although, if, if they got it within, you know, probably a 20 or 30 mile radius and they showed your picture to someone. Yeah. They would at least recognize you. That's, that's, there's no anonymity this is, in the woods. That's right. That's right. Well... Not to boast, but I think if you showed my picture to uh, <laughs> radius, probably goes more than twenty miles. <laughs> I, I, I bet it does. I bet it does. <laughs> now, now, when you moved back, when you moved out here, when you moved back east, did did you start teaching martial arts right away? Uh, no, actually, that's a that's a great question. I started working at the Mount Washington Hotel. Okay, and um, a beautiful spot. If, if if anybody listening has never seen that hotel, look it up. Look it, it up. You yep. will you will think I'm making this up and look up the history on it. It's uh, the, the the armistice from World War One was signed there. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And I got a job. I got a job working at this at this ski shop across the street. And then the, the guy who owns this, the ski shop, we call him the mayor of Brenton Woods. He's uh, Jimmy Drummond. Great guy. He was the um, guest service manager at the hotel. So he, he said, because of my love for people, again, um, he put me at the front door doing uh, ballet. So I was running every day. I was uh, in great shape and running for cars and making good money. And I did that for about four or five years. And I spoke. I, I talk a lot. Again, you know, I like to talk. So I told people what I did and where I was from. And I, I got a group of people that said, if you open up a school, I'll come. And when I realized, all right, I'll give it a go. Then I started. And I haven't looked back since. That was 2005. So 16 years, 16 years up here doing it and enjoying it. It was great. It's been great and still going. How is it? Is it your full-time gig? Uh, no, uh, prevention is my full-time gig now. Okay, that's right. You did say that. Yeah, so, I work so as when, prevention specialist. 
you've used some of the same language talking about teaching martial arts to children as that work. Yeah. So I'm guessing there's a story in there and how all that happened. Probably some synergy too. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a martial artist, I'm a teacher. Um, that's kind of how I define myself, you know? Um, I think, like I told you earlier and earlier in this, um, in this conversation that I found my true calling of teaching. So, um, I was teaching full time. I was only teaching, but I wasn't really working that. I've been very fortunate to, um, not have to work too hard and can be around my kids a lot, but as my kids got older and my bank account dwindled, it was, uh, it was, it was let it, it was known, it was being told to me by my wife that I needed to get a job, another job to supplement. And, uh, of, of course she did it very tactfully. Um, <laughs> not but um <laughs> but she she you know it's, it's like hey you know we should probably you should probably get a job and uh said, yeah you know you're right i probably i have time and i'm teaching you know i'm not teaching every day for hours so i got a job working for uh the north country charter academy it's a charter school for uh disadvantaged and at-risk kids that can't navigate through high school and i i loved it i loved it got to connect with a lot of different kids, um, that really needed help. I was able to have some success in some prevention programs that the school that I initiated a prevention program, um, called the up conference. And it was centered around youth making a difference to other youth and having the adults support them. So youth directed adult guided is kind of the, the term we use. So I realized that I can't, uh, tell kids, tell young adults how to, um, how to, how to act. They don't hear it. Like my own daughter doesn't hear it from me, but if somebody else says it, it becomes a revelation. You know, the things that I've been saying for, for two hours don't resonate, but then somebody else says it and they're like, Oh, you know what they said? Yeah, I know. I've been saying that. So, um, youth to youth, positive, positive youth to youth, um, messaging, is really the theme. And with that success uh, that I had with that, I was offered a job as a prevention coordinator for the region. So it went from teaching to, um, to have a little more of an administrative position, a little higher up. So, yeah, but it is still, and always will be about building communities, about making, uh, making people better through connection and community because uh, addiction lies in loneliness and dark spaces. But when you, when we connect with each other and we kind of fill, fill those voids, voids with community, whether it be martial arts, uh, the arts, music, um, whatever it is, if you're in a community, you have something to keep you, you know, to keep you connected to people. And that, that kind of keeps, um, addiction at bay. If that makes sense. It does. It does. I, I've always viewed addiction as an attempt to plug a hole. Yeah. yeah there's, there's a hole. There's, there's something a missing. Right. Right. And a lot of times it's the connection, it's connections that are missing. You know, and I think um, the more we can build communities and that's why this is such a tough time right now, because we're not able to really go and interact um, socially so much anymore. So there's, um, I think there's a great need to find ways, creative ways to build those connections. I agree. So, yeah. you know, what, what are you doing? What's your school doing? You oh, know, clearly open. community is so critical to you. I can't imagine that you're just hanging back going, Oh, you know, whatever. Yeah, we're open. Um, I'm invested in a little bit of um, internet connection so I can do online classes if I need to. But right now we're open. Classes are small. And uh, as long as they stay somewhat small, I'll keep doing them because of the importance for these, I have, I have more students than, um, than ever right now with the classes oh, we're trying to, we, you know, we're trying to separate the classes so they can be smaller. So people aren't uh, crowding each other. And I have a large, I have a pretty large space. I'm fortunate to have a large space that we can uh, spread out. What do you teach? You know, uh, you, you've, 
<laughs> you mentioned so many things that oh, you've God. done. Are you no. teaching all of them? No. So I teach in adult cl- my adult and um, my adult class is basically uh, jujitsu, self defense. It's based in Hakurio, but um, you know, small circle emphasis, no doubt, um, through all my influences from Wally J. Um, so it's joint locks, throws, uh, teaching all different ranges. So we punch, we kick, um, we throw. You know, Wally J always said, well, if you get in a fight in the phone booth, you know, <laughs> you want to, you want to be able to, um, defend yourself from all different ranges. And I've always tried to become a well-rounded, well-rounded school. So my, I, we teach jujitsu, uh, regular jujitsu class. I have a, a uh, jujitsu instructor, a Brazilian jujitsu instructor, Ian Milligan, one of my guys who started with my regular class and, you know, has a passion and a tremendous love for Brazilian jujitsu. So he's been taking that on and um I, I let him teach it you know we, we work together and I, I i want him to to do as much as he can it's small up here so uh, he's teaching that class i have um people that have been around for a while like my uh this young kid who started with me when he was like seven he's 21 i think tomorrow or pretty soon he turns 21 and uh, his name's juliano rossi he teaches some of my boxing and mma classes so we offer that um i teach kids class on Saturdays and I teach peewees, five to seven year olds. I teach um, eight to 12 year olds after that. We have an advanced class. And yeah, that's that's kind of about it. So there's some boxing, kickboxing, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but the base is Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Sounds like it's a busy place. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm very fortunate. And um, we're in the process of becoming a uh, police athletic league, so we can do some more. So we can do some uh, affect more kids in the community through uh, wrestling programs and boxing programs. Oh wow! I'm I'm not familiar with this with this offering. Is that is this a, a New Hampshire thing or? Um, there's not too many in New Hampshire. There's only one in there's one in Manchester and there's one in Nashville. So Manchester Police Athletic League and uh, the one in Nashville. So we've. Um, it's, it was up here before, uh, the passion, the person in charge, um, left the police force. So it kind of died with him and the new police chief, uh, he's been around for a couple of years and a uh, chief of police in Lancaster's approached me and wanted to become, wanted to get it started back up again because of the positive impact it has in the community. So we we're starting it back up. And, and what is this program? Well, it'll be boxing and wrestling, and it'll be an after-school program where um, I, I think it'll be free to kids. It's sponsored by, uh, pretty much sponsored by donations in the town. And that sounds and awesome. Through, and through some grants as well. Why isn't this bigger? It's a good question. It, why isn't it? And that it is pretty big. <laughs> sounds like a no-brainer. Yeah, I know. Outside of here, I think it is pretty big. At least athletic. I know when I was younger, I, um, I, so I started in basketball. My love was basketball. And um, when I was 16, I was, see, I've always been kind of a wise guy, um, smart Alex. So I, I, I was kind of banned, not banned, but I was kind of like blacklisted from my basketball team in high school. But I, but I was, uh, I had a voracious appetite for basketball. So I played all. Are we going to get that story? Uh, No, I don't think it's suitable for. uh, Okay. All right. uh, Fair enough. (laughs) We'll just, we'll have to wonder. I called the coach out in a manner of digging a shovel to shovel the bull. And oh, while he turned right. his back at halftime. And I, and the more he turned his back, the quicker I went and he caught me doing it. And everybody was laughing. It was kind of a tense moment, but I think that was the last straw with him. Cause he, okay. he made a promise that everybody would play. He'd get everybody in and then he broke the promise. Mm. So, you know, I, I just, I was looking out for like, everybody on the team, especially me, because I wasn't a starter. But anyway, um, so through basketball, what was what was I getting at, Jeremy? You totally derailed. Uh, basketball was your first love. We were talking police, oh, athletic, police athletic league. league. Yeah. So so not making my team, I played I played in a PAL league, police athletic league, and I was good. So I was one of um I was the only person from my team, but I was one of like uh we represented Long Island down in Florida on an all expense pay, paid trip to uh, Florida. And, um, and probably when I was 16, 
So it would probably be like 1979. And it's pretty funny because I, I, I cherish this picture. I was the only white guy on the team. And I don't think I even saw a white person in the crowd. And um, I learned a lot from that. I learned that, um, you know, the guys that I bonded with on my team, they had they made me the captain. I think they really felt for me because I was the minority. And they really looked after me, too. They really, um, you know, like other people other people would come up and start to mess with me because of the color of my skin. And, um, I had guys stand up for me like I was one of their brothers. So a great experience for police athletic league. Nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. So let's, let's flip the clock. Let's look into the future. Yeah. You know, when we have people on, we talk about where they're at. We talk about where they've come from. So the question is, where are you headed? Where am I headed? Good question. Um, I think I'm going to be doing this for a really long time. Um, I'm just trying to set up some sustainability so that I can, I, I've used my body quite a bit and, um, you know, through doing some stunt work in, in LA and years and years of martial arts. And, um, I just want, I want this to continue for a long time. So it's right now it's about building, um, uh, building a sustainable, uh, model that, the people that learn from me can continue. Even one, there's a guy, one of my top students, my top student up here, this second degree black belt with me. He just opened the school in Littleton. So that makes me very happy. You know, the fact that I can keep the art going, keep the, um, keep this going, keep the building of communities going. That's really what's next for me. Find ways to keep it moving along, even though I'm not around. I like so it. it. Keep spreading the word. Yep. Yeah. If people want to get a hold of you, you know, websites or social media or any of that, where would they go? Oh, kazejujitsu.com. K A Z E J U J I T S U dot com. Kazejujitsu.com. That's my yeah, website. You can always get right. hold of me. Uh, my phone is embedded in my ear. So I'm always on it constantly. It's very West Coast of you. Yeah. Yeah, left coast. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah, and, and of course, if, if anybody didn't get that website, we'll put it in the show notes at whistlekickmarshartsradio.com. Well, this this has been fun. I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, I appreciate that. And, you know, you've listened to the show before, so you know what's coming next, and that is, you know, how do you want to close up? What what are your final words for the people listening? Uh, well, I think I'd go back to say, uh, reach out to somebody if you know they're struggling. You know, the connection and community is probably the most important thing, the important thing we have as human beings in, the, in these times right now. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't want to get preachy, but people are struggling and um, and we need to, we really need to reach out to each other and be there. Uh, martial arts community has shown me a love and respect that um, has changed my life forever from the first class I took and being part of that group to right now leading a group um, and being a part of it, there's nothing like it. So, you know, if you get an opportunity to create a group of people, like-minded people, no matter what, whether it's martial arts or any other kind of art or endeavor, start a group, connect with people, share your passion and don't be afraid. Um, we all, we all think alike. We all have our, um, we all have our anxiety about, what people think. And it's easy to say, I don't care what people think. We all care what people think, but people are thinking the same thing you are. So stick around those people that applaud you and disregard the people that don't want to, um, that, that don't get you, you know, don't, don't waste time on them. That's all. I'm, that's what, that's what I'd have to say. What a fun conversation. And you know, here we go. Yet another person that I just want to drop everything and go train with and have a good time. I, I It's one of my favorite things about the show, as I'm sure you all know. I've had the opportunity to train with quite a few people. And given the distance, which is not very great in this case, I've got a really good feeling that some training will happen in the future with Sensei Greg and I. Maybe there will even be some video of it and you can all see. Sir, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for your time, your stories. And I hope we do get to talk and connect soon. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the website. This is episode 576. 
You'll find a bunch of stuff over there for this episode, as well as all the other episodes that we've done. You can sign up for the newsletter. And if you want to support us, you can use the code podcast15 at whistlekick.com. You could share stuff, review stuff, Patreon stuff. There's a ton of it out there. You listen to the intro. You know what you can do to help us out. And those of you who do, thank you. Really, really means a lot to me. If you have feedback, guest, or topic suggestions, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.